advisors, John Everson and Phil McCoy. And Phil joins us now via telephone. Philly, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, guys. How are you all? I, personally, I'm hungry. How about you, John? <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. Bill? No, if I, you mentioned food. You. Mentioned food. I'm hmm. ready. Be a little bit hungry now, Bill? All right, there yeah. you go. That's that's the updated status quo here, Phil. Well, I think Bill would have brought some snacks in, but the last time he did, you, you chastised him for it just because he <laughs> Because he was, he was eating them on the way in. Uh, yeah, I did well, that. But and now I, that... The end result is now that you're hungry. Yeah. <laughs> Actions have consequences. That, that's right. And also, yeah. uh, add to that, uh, Phil, my wife slaved for weeks and we no, hours and hours, <laughs> making this wonderful coconut cake. And Rob took one look at it and said, that ain't a coconut cake. And my poor wife was chastised. <laughs> she has not never recovered. She has not be, uh, made me a coconut cake since then. Do, do you know what the giveaway that it wasn't a coconut cake was, Phil? <laughs> On the icing, there, on the icing, there was a giant carrot, <laughs> not a giant coconut, a giant carrot. A coconut, a coconut carrot cake. Yeah. Together. Well, the coconut got to the white. Uh, uh, no wonder you're by. hungry, Rob. Yeah, nobody's going to bring you food in, Rob. <laughs> and and because and because of that failed, John Gilstrap and I are suffering. I, all I'm thinking is all this happened on a day I wasn't here. <laughs> the only thing I can figure is I must have licked a gift, gift horse in the mouth. You know, so yeah, the only thing I can yeah, figure. there you go. Bring it back around on me. There you go. That's the only thing I can come up with. should never lick a gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> Sound advice for You've all people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Phil, what the heck was that yesterday at uh, Akershore Stadium, formerly known as Heinz Field? That was <laughs> ugly, man. That was our Pittsburgh Steelers, and the sad, the saddest part about yesterday is that I wasn't surprised. And I wanted to get because we were texting each other back and forth after the first quarter, and I said, if they blow this, I'll be really disappointed. And you said, oh, they're going to blow it. And my initial reaction was I wanted to get on you for being negative, but I knew you were right. Yeah. And so I just kept my mouth shut. So that was it was really disappointing because they have – two teams that they should easily beat that would have taken them to nine and four and to get blown out at home by the two and 10 Cardinals, three and 10 Cardinals now was extremely disappointing, but I can't say that I was, I was surprised in the least. I was, I wasn't surprised. And, and I'm starting to wonder if coming over to your side, that maybe, maybe Mike Tomlin has run his course in Pittsburgh because that's, there's just no excuse for that. You know, home game, the weather conditions were Pittsburgh-esque. They should have uh, flourished in those types of conditions, and they put up and, – and, and honestly, they put up three points. You know, they scored at the end of the game, but it was just Arizona letting them score slowly. So they, they put up three points when it mattered against the Arizona Cardinals. So that was just disappointing, but the most disappointing thing is – as I wasn't surprised. Yeah, I thought you were going to put this at the feet of uh, they let go their offensive coordinator a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> no, and I bet he's probably sitting at home now smiling just a little bit. You know, against the Bengals, they look like an NFL offense, but quickly gave that away. They're still running the ball okay, but, man, some of the decisions that they make and just the inability to put the ball in the end zone, you can't do that in today's NFL. And it was just disappointing. You start to look at the players. So we blame the coaches and we blame back Canada and we, we blame everyone except for the players. But on the offensive side of the ball and honestly on the defensive side except for a few who where would these guys go? Where would they make where would they be standout players anywhere other than Pittsburgh? You know, on the offensive side you've got a handful, you know, maybe Pickens has some a lot of has a lot of talent and could do something somewhere. But aside from that, what do they have? And on the defensive side, you have T.J. Watt, who I hate to beat on T.J. Watt because he's a family favorite, but he makes big splash plays. But as the game's coming to an end and you need to stop someone on third and nine, he misses a tackle on and, and lets a, 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 a James Conner come back to good for him. I mean, I like the guy. But just run down their throat, and he missed a few tackles there toward the end. But we never criticize him for, for those sort of things. And he got blocked for the majority of the day by a rookie, one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And so, you know, other than, but other than T.J. Watt and an aging Fitzpatrick, what do they have on defense to be excited about? It's just uh, So you start to look at their entire roster and think maybe these guys, maybe maybe they don't have the talent that they, we think they do. I think you meant an aging Hayward because Minka's still pretty young. 
Well, no, I meant aging Minka too, because what's he done this year other than be hurt? And I mean, it's <laughs> age is relative to. to he's like twenty six <laughs> though. To your performance, he's not that young. He's I don't not that care. Old. I don't care. <laughs> those, I mean, what's he those done? Are bad move. See, that's the thing. When when the Steelers lose, I, I used to be like that too. I don't want to talk football. I don't want to watch ESPN. I don't want to know nothing about sports until about Friday. It's about time time I gear well, gear back. But we've become accustomed, though. We've become accustomed, and, and there is a lot of good football. Martinsburg won the state championship. I know you don't like crossing streams, but your Oakdale uh, won the state championship. And we had a wonderful argument all weekend long about college football. And I think that's part of the attraction to college football is these arguments that who should be in the playoffs and who deserves Florida it. State and should so be that, in, Phil. Know, Florida State should, should be in. You go undefeated and not. win a Power 5 conference, you should be in. I mean, I understand their argument. And if I was a Florida State fan, I'd be screaming to the top of my lungs. But the fact of the matter is, is they can't compete with any of those other three teams. We, they, we they don't know. Blown out. We don't know. We, do know. we don't know because they, they, they didn't get invited. Out. They didn't get invited. They How do we know? Out. They that's, would also get blown that's just your out opinion. By Ohio State and Georgia. That's a Phil opinion right opinion now. At most. <laughs> that's it's a not Phil just opinion. A Phil opinion. There's only a Phil opinion. And I've watched these. And and I watched, and I I did watch Florida State and Louisville, and I thought to myself, God forbid if they get in and have to play (laughs) a Michigan or an Alabama or a Georgia or or Ohio State because they would get annihilated. Those poor, and I I get it. Their starting quarterbacks hurt, and it's not no one's fault. And and they do have an argument, and it's a legitimate argument. They went undefeated in a Power Five conference, and but if you're making that decision about who gets in. Well, you take the best four conferences, which is probably factual, you know, those four guys, those four teams, and the, and the, the team that won the championship. So uh, th- I think that was an easy decision. Can for, we for can we team. agree on one thing, that it, that Tony Petrucci's Notre Dame probably team not. was excluded, and that's a good thing. <laughs> enough, about, enough about Notre Dame. I'm tired of Notre Dame getting hyped all year long and then getting crushed in one of these semifinal games every, every year. Enough Notre Dame. Can we agree that's a good thing? Sorry, Tony Petrucci. Well, yeah, I mean, because they, they probably didn't belong either. But but it was – it did and they, I, I don't disagree. Florida State does have a legitimate argument, but I do think they got it right. If you're looking for a combination of the best four teams and the most deserving, uh, that they, they probably did get it right. So it's a, But it's an inexact science, and it's an argument that makes college football so fun this time of year. Well, it's also, Phil, is an argument that we're going from 4 to 12 playoffs next year. So uh, this won't be an argument now. This will not be an argument next year. But I think in last year, if memory serves, uh, the top four were pretty well accepted by everybody. But this time, if you, if you leave Georgia out, if you leave Ohio State out, if you leave Florida State out, if you leave some of these other powerhouses, it, a strong case can be made that is exceptionally yeah. subjective as opposed to being some sort of reasonable objective decision. Yes, and, and, and that, I think that's fun. Yeah, I do. I think it's because they all do. Now, if I, it wouldn't be fun if I was a fan. I'm not a fan of really any college football team, but if I was a fan of any of those three teams, I'd be livid right now. But they all have a solid case. Now, if you watch these teams play, in my opinion, and, of course, my opinion because the Pittsburgh Steelers doesn't carry much weight, but in my opinion, the best four teams in college probably come from two conferences. It's probably Michigan, Ohio State, Georgia, and Alabama in whatever order you want to put them in. But that's probably the best four. But you couldn't put those four in. You couldn't put Alabama in and not put Texas in because Texas beat them. So you have to put Texas in. So I kind of think that Alabama getting in drug Texas in. If it wasn't for for that, Texas wouldn't have gotten in. And maybe, honestly, maybe not even Alabama uh, because you you could not put Alabama in without putting Texas in. So it did make it easy, an easier decision for whatever group of people uh, come up with that. Look, it's four conference champions. It's probably the four strongest conferences. So let's put them in, and and Texas and Alabama um, would would fit that bill, and Texas gets in because they beat Alabama. So, but you do have a really strong argument if you're, especially if you're Florida State. Uh, Georgia, of course, has an argument. They were number one right up until the last day and lost a close close game with injured players themselves. And of course, Ohio State has an argument as well. Their only loss was to Michigan in Michigan, and it was really close. So, but it it, it makes it all fun. Next all year, fun. all that fun goes away because with twelve teams well, I don't know, in, because you can still argue it won't be as it won't be as strongly debated. 
But you could argue 12 and 13, and there'll be teams no. at 13, 14, and 15 that don't get in, but no. it won't be strongly, as strongly debated. People will argue it because you need to talk about something to fill time, but there's no legitimate argument yeah. as to why the 13th team should be considered to win a national championship. Yeah. If you're yeah. 13, you're yeah. not winning. It'll, it'll be an argument, but it won't be as yeah. Hey, you know, let's talk uh, money here, Philip, as we uh, begin the first Monday, the full first full uh, trading week of the month of December. So I heard some people on these uh, opinion shows talking earlier this morning mentioned the fact that if uh, you're positive all the way through the month of November, December's usually a very good trading month anyway, so the markets should finish 2023 strongly positive. I hope so, and the, the momentum is that it will, but what can change that is this Friday, and of course the Federal Reserve has its meeting in mid-December. I don't remember the exact date, but the tone of what the Federal Reserve says, it's pretty set in stone. They're not going to increase rates in December, and they're certainly not going to cut them. But what will the tone be from Jerome Powell after the meeting and when he talks? Leading up to that, there's going to, of course, there's going to be some data that we get that could dictate what his tone would be. And that starts this Friday with the jobs report. Probably as hotly debated as who should be in the top four is the, the jobs report and the unemployment numbers and the wages and knowing that, that, that we need to see softness in that in order for our markets to continue to run. And, and a lot of people don't like that. They don't, they don't like that, that that is factual, that the Federal Reserve needs to see some weakness in our labor market in order for our markets to continue to run at the clip that it did in November. But that is what they need to see, and that's what they need to see before they start talking rate cuts. And that is, if you, if you look through Google and say, well, what's mentioned more, rate hikes or rate cuts? Now it's rate cuts. And they'll start to cut rates when that, when that uh, decline in positive employment numbers start to increase. And because when they increase or decrease rates, it takes a while to make its way through the economy. So they'll try to catch that to keep us from going into a recession. And that's when we'll be able to eventually look back and say, how did the Federal Reserve do through all of this COVID, COVID loosening and tightening and how does our economy and our stock market look? Remember, they're not one in the same, but how do they look once it's all done? And that's when we'll get a true reflection. You know, some are, some are down on the Federal Reserve and some have made excuses for them. I've got my hand raised right now. But we, we won't really know the, the exact outcome of that. The fourth quarter of that is coming to whether or not they've done a good job or, or not. And, and we'll start to find that out, especially this month. But as far as December's concerned, I, I would argue that we, we need to see a Grinch rally opposed to a Santa Claus rally in December. We need to see consumers hold on to their purse strings a little bit tighter than what they have in the past, and that would be a strong signal to the Federal Reserve that they have they've at least started to accomplish their goal of slowing the consumer down. It's, been, it's proven to be really difficult. That was part of the reason why we had such a bad September and October was consumer consumer numbers and retail numbers were much stronger than what we anticipated, so we gave some of our gains back for 2023. But when you, as we come to a close on 2023 and you step back and look at what it's looked like, it's been a pretty good year, especially if you're focusing in on the S&P and NASDAQ. It's been a really good year for both of those indices, and the biggest reason for that is because the Federal Reserve has slowed down and we've seen – more weakness on the consumer side and the employment side. Bill? Yeah, uh, good morning, Phil. Uh, John will have a hardball question for you. I have a softball <laughs> question. Uh, every <laughs> every week we hear another al uh, uh, alphabet soup sort of organization that CPI or C CPI, all of them. There's a host of them that you use, and each one has a special meaning and special place is there one or two that the uh, federal reserve pays most attention to yes they, they pay most attention to and there, there's two of them and they're, they're kind of they're the first one and the last one uh but the federal reserve says they pay most attention to uh the personal consumption or the pce the expenditures that's what they pay most attention to however our markets pay most attention to the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, because it's typically the first one that we get. So by the time you get to the PCE numbers, we kind of know what those are because of all the other numbers that have gone into it. 
but the Federal Reserve, what they base their decisions off of, uh, more so than any other, is the PCE. Our markets focus on the CPI, and it typically that's first. So the order that they normally go in, CPI, Consumer Price Index, PPI, Producer Price Index, and then the PCE is dead last. And they focus on that, but our markets, because it's the first indication of what it looks like, what it's going to look like for that month, is the CPI. So the most important, in my opinion, CPI and the PCE, uh, the PPI, and I like how you call that the alpha, alphabet soup because it is a lot, uh, but the producer price index is typically sandwiched in the middle. And something Tyler and I are in, in our office have noticed that it, we, it doesn't always fall in line. I don't know why. Sometimes the PPI comes out first. It's not often, but sometimes the PPI comes out first. But for our markets, the consumer price index is, is the, the main mover. And for the Federal Reserve, uh, they say anyway that they focus on the PCE the most. Financial Phil, our guest here, Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the Marius Group of Financial Advisors on Winchester Avenue in Martinsburg. All right, John, Phil's ready for the tough questions now. <clears throat> I don't know if it's a tough question. A, a bit of a rant maybe, and always imagine a question mark at the end of the rant. Um, Just raise your voice. Then. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, at the, at yeah. the end. Um, <clears throat> We're in a situation, we're talking about finally inflation is coming. Wall Street Journal had an article, has had a series of articles over the last few days that it appears that inflation might actually make its way down, back down to 2%, the, the, the magic number. And, and here's, I want to separate the markets from the economy. Again, we've talked about, about this before. Uh, again, according to the journal, the prices have gone up 19% since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, a gallon of whole milk cost three twenty five before the pandemic. It's four dollars now. A pound of ground chuck was four ten. Now it's five thirty five. Car prices have increased by thirty percent. Credit card debt is almost at, at record levels. We've got in, in, uh, Mortgage rates that are have touched 8% and are now have plummeted back down to the mid-7s. The damage that has been done, especially when you look at the credit card debt that is that is, is frighteningly high, it, it feels a little like 2007, 2008 to me. And this... It, it feels like the the Bidenomics, not to go totally political, but where we are right now, it feels very fragile to me, and it feels like it it can it can shatter just on a whim and uh, and create big problems for the economy, which would then be reflected in the markets. Am I wrong? Here's the question: Am I wrong? No, it it is fragile, but some of those numbers that you had just referenced, high credit card debt and uh, some of the prices that have increased. So what the and, and I'll, I'll go back to the Federal Reserve because they did this on purpose. And what they have tried to accomplish is is to slow the consumer down. So once that consumer slows down and slows down for good, and we can see prolonged evidence. We've seen spotty evidence uh, from from month to month that they're slowing down. That's why Christmas is so important. But once the consumer slows down then those prices will drop back down to more normal levels. They may not drop back down to what they were pre-pandemic, but they'll drop, especially in, in the area of food. One of those measures that you look at is consumer debt. And while, while the overall economy in normal times when you're not battling inflation, the, a large amount of consumer debt, especially credit card, isn't, is, is frowned upon. But in this period, while we're battling inflation, that's something that the Federal Reserve wants to see. Maxed out credit cards means that the consumer's going to slow down. And that's one of the reasons why they increase rates. So when they increase rates, look at you, you had mentioned homes. And when you increase rates, it makes it more difficult to buy a home. It makes it more difficult to refinance or pull money from equity out of your home. And it makes it more expensive. So you can't spend as much. You can't do those home improvements. You can't typically, and this hasn't slowed down yet. But it, it's more difficult to travel. You don't have as much uh, discretionary income. So some of the it, it is fragile. And but the the fragile part of it comes. And again, this is why Christmas is so important. Is the fragile part of it comes is how resilient are consumers? And that resiliency has been a problem. It's been a problem for the Federal Reserve, and which is why the rates are as high as they are right now. That's one of the reasons why credit card debt is as high as it is because if you're carrying a balance and those adjustable rates, which most credit cards are, 
those adjustable rates go up, it's more difficult to pay it down than like it was at the beginning of, of uh, COVID when they were much, much lower. So all of those things that was done, and that's the difference between now and 2007, 2008, is this was done on purpose. It wasn't an accident. It was absolutely done on purpose. But it is fragile, and the, but the fragile part of it comes from will consumers continue, which is why Christmas is so important or the holiday season, will the con- consumers continue be damned with how much money they owe on their credit cards or, or how little money they have, will they continue to spend? And if they do, then that's a bad thing uh, for the uh, stock market, and it's kind of a bad thing for the economy, too, because that would cause the Federal Reserve to keep rates. I don't think they want to increase them anymore, but it would cause them to keep rates higher for longer. And is it safe to say that if we had not thrown three trillion additional dollars into the economy yeah. just because we could, life would be a yeah. lot easier right now? Well, yeah, yeah. John, that's that's hindsight. Saying, yeah, but at the well, time, no, it was not hindsight. Yes, we knew it was going to happen hindsight. at the time. No, well, but well, they they did know, and and Mitch McConnell said that he said that, uh, and his statement was, and we talked about it a lot, was you don't worry about the water damage when your house is on fire because they had never, we had never been through this before. So the amount of money that we threw into the economy from so many different ways, whether it was decreasing rates or stimulus checks or PPP loans or enhanced and extended unemployment benefits, all of those things contributed to what we're dealing with right now. But, you know, where I'll, I'll take up for them and what Mitch McConnell said, they never dealt with anything like this before where we purposefully shut down our own economy. But you're 100% correct. This is undoing what we did during the COVID era. So I still say we're in our COVID markets. We're just in the hopefully the last leg of it. But now we're repairing that looseness that we had done, so we can so consumers would continue once things open up, so they would continue to spend money and keep our economy afloat. It just looks like we went a little bit too far, and now they're trying to repair it. As we get into the fourth quarter. If the Federal Reserve can keep us from going into a deep, long recession, then I would say what they have done was successful. If they, if we do go into a deep, long recession, and we, ha- we haven't really started talking about that yet, not until these economic numbers get really bad, but if we do go into a deep, long recession, then they would have failed. Rob would be right, and I would be wrong. But the flip side, if we don't, if it's just a short recession or no recession at all, a soft landing, then they would have accomplished what they were trying to do. They weren't responsible for all of it, but they were responsible for some of it by cutting rates as quickly as they did back in April of 2020. Sounds yeah. like the police are closing in on you, Phil. You better <laughs> hit to a new location. <laughs> but to, to yeah, put, well. yeah, we can uh, approach this last week as well. Uh, one way to look at it is relative terms. Uh, I would I would argue that U.S. has has managed this a lot better than much of the rest of the world. I don't disagree. I think we have uh, simply because if you look at where we are right now, if you look at where our economy is, just take a snapshot. Take a snapshot of uh, pre-COVID and take a snapshot of right now. We're in pretty decent shape. Our markets are higher than it was pre-COVID. Our unemployment, even though this is part of the problem, our unemployment numbers are close to where they were pre-COVID. Wages have have grown. It's still part of the problem, but wages have grown. If you just take a snapshot and ignore everything in between, would you say back in in February of 2020, would you accept this now in December of 2023? I think most people would say, yes, we would accept that. But there's still the fourth quarter to come with this undoing of all the COVID, of, of the COVID relief. There's still the undoing of that. But as of right now, I think most people would accept that. Don't look at anything in between. Let's just look at February of 2020 and let's look at right now and forget all the COVID stuff. Would we have accepted this as far as market growth and how our economy is doing? We'd probably say, yeah, we'd have some gripes. We'd have some gripes, of course, about price of energy and the the pipelines. And we, we would have a lot of gripes. But I think overall we would accept it. Bill, how do we reach you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Philip. Have a great day.